Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about evolution of informed consent. I am Dr. Suresh Badadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. In this video, I will be discussing about evolution of informed consent. What are the different ingredients of informed consent? Understanding this concept of consent. What is the difference between a reasonable physician versus reasonable patient standard which the information is given during the administration of informed consent various case laws with regard to consent what are the paradigm shift which has occurred in the consent will be discussed in this video let's understand the meaning of consent consent means permission or agreement or approval that is permission for something to happen or agreement to do something or to agree to something or give permission for something basically it is the agreement or an approval it can be considered as a contract also from the perspective of healthcare bioethics dictates about the consent. The foundation of consent is autonomy, that is, truth telling and confidentiality also includes autonomy. Let us understand what is this autonomy which plays such a crucial role in consent. All persons have intrinsic and unconditional worth and therefore should have the power to make rational decisions and moral choices and each should be allowed to exercise his or her capacity for self-determination in simple word by the virtue of being a human being you have right to self-determination to determine what should be done with your body will you subject for treatment or surgery is left to the individual choice that is what is called as consent. The doctor may be charged for negligence if he fails to give required information to the patient before obtaining his consent to a particular surgery or intervention. This explains the role of valid consent in the medical arena, my dear friends. That means, without informed consent, if the doctor treats it can be considered under the tort law, under criminal law, it can be considered as an assault. Let's understand various ingredients of informed consent. All information which needs to be provided to the patient should be as much as possible in non-medical terms and in patient's own language, which is simple and easy to understandable for the patient. What is that information which should be given? It is the nature of the diagnosis, nature of the proposed treatment, what are the alternatives for treatment, what is the risk involved in not taking treatment, what are the risks and benefits involved in proposed treatment, risk and benefits for alternative procedure and the relative chances of success and failure in the proposed treatment. And invariably, in various countries, they do also need to disclose about the course and outcome of the proposed treatment. Let's understand how this consent has evolved over a period of time. There are two important methods which are prevailing at this point of time. The old one is called as conventional method and contemporary method is the current one. What is this conventional method? The conventional medical doctrine to withhold significant information for patient, particularly potentially upsetting information to the patient. This is the conventional old method. That means the doctor used to decide what information should be given to the patient. It was the paternalistic attitude of the doctor and the physician which determined what information should be told to the patient. If I give certain information, the patient 
his illness may deteriorate or he may refuse for treatment. Under this paternalistic attitude, the conventional method prevailed for a long time. This was the common practice which prevailed over a period of time. Even now, if the patient has a serious illness or a stage for cancer, he may live only for a few days. Many doctors do not disclose. They have this thinking that it may not be good for the patient. Many practitioners revealed only those information which anybody in that profession will provide. Hence the following formula was proposed. Professional standard of disclosure. Now this is nothing but Boalam test my dear friends. That means if a doctor is providing information for a procedure, the informed consent administered should be valid in the court of law. That means any other doctor in the same profession providing same procedure, then you need to give similar information. Then only it will be considered as professional standard of disclosure. That is Boland test. But however, many developed countries had moved into something called as contemporary method, also called as prudent patient test or reasonable patient test. Here, the healthcare provider, the paternalistic attitude has been cut down. The healthcare provide, provider would need to give the fullest information possible or all possible options what a reasonable person would want to know in order to make an informed choice. Here, if the patient is educated, he needs to get all possible information. That means, many of the rights activists say 100% compliance is required. This is called as a reasonable patient test. That means a reasonable person, what information he is required to make certain decision. That is prudent patient test or reasonable patient test. With regard to informed consent, my dear friends, on one hand, there is free will to decide that is consent. On the other hand, it is providing adequate information of the procedure so that the patient decide. That means consent and providing adequate information are the two sides of the same coin that you need to understand. The consent becomes invalid if you don't provide adequate information, enable the patient, empower the patient to make decision. Then only it will become valid informed consent. Let's discuss about this reasonable physician standard versus reasonable patient standard by various case laws, my dear friends. The first and the foremost case law I would like to discuss, which was decided in 1914, that is Kollendorf versus Society of New York Hospital. In January 1908, Maris Kollendorf was admitted in New York Hospital to evaluate and treatment of stomach pain. She had severe abdominal pain. The visiting physician recommended surgery, for which the Maris Kollendorf completely refused for any kind of surgery. However, she consented for an examination under anesthesia. During the anesthetic procedure, the doctor performed surgery to remove the tumor which she had. Afterwards, Skolendorf developed gangrene in the left arm, ultimately leading to the amputation of the sum of the fingers of the patient. The patient, that is Mary Skolandrov, blamed the surgeon and filed a suit against the surgeon. The court found that this was a non-profit hospital. That means this hospital is based from public funding. That is Society of New York Hospital. Hence, they decided not to punish the doctor. Here, it was a completely a charitable institute where the doctor provided the benefit to the patient. That means the decision was taken in the best interest of the patient. And the prevailing law clearly said that 
non-profit hospital could not be held liable for the action of its employee and the doctor also should not be punished because he acted in the best interest of the patient. This decision from the judge, that is Justice Benjamin Cardos, gave an important verdict. Although both the hospital and the doctors were not held liable, but he made certain observation, which is quoted till date, my dear friends. That is Justice Benjamin Cardoz, who said, Every human being of an adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. And a surgeon who performs an operation without his patient consent commits an assault for which he is liable in damages. This is true except in case of emergency where the patient is unconscious and where it is necessary to operate before the consent can be obtained. And this paragraph from Justice Benjamin Cardoz holds good till date, my dear friends. But however, over a period of time, that is, post-World War II, Nuremberg Code came into picture. What is this Nuremberg Code? This code was drafted at the end of World War II. The doctors who were trialed in the Nuremberg Code in 1947 came up with an important document which is now also used in medical and research field. This landmark document developed in response to the horror of the human experimentation done by the Nazi physicians and investigators. Six of the ten principles which have been transferred into the Nuremberg Code are derived from the guidelines of human experimentation of 1931, my dear friends. Out of the 23 accused, 20 doctors were inducted on four counts under the Nuremberg Code. The count one was the common design or conspiracy, two was war crimes, third was crime against humanity and the fourth was membership of a criminal organization. And this Nuremberg Code holds good in certain areas till date, my dear friends. Along with this, at the same time, during the World War II, there was another study, which is syphilis study at Tuskegee, needs to be mentioned here. In 1932, United States of America, the public health services began a study to record the natural history of the syphilis. Please remember, it is 1932. There was no treatment available. Hence, the United States of America decided to do a study, the natural course and outcome of syphilis. Study was titled as Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in Negro Male. Look at the title of the study. The study involved 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, 200 and one people who did not have this disease. Participants were informed with that you will get benefit of food and burial benefit. But they were never told about the study. They were never told that they are suffering from syphilis and they are being absorbed over a period of time. None of the participants in the Tuskegee trial knew that it was a study on syphilis. Researchers told that they are absorbing the blood, bad blood in them and in exchange for the observation, free medical examination, free meals and a burial insurance. During the study, in 1943, penicillin was considered as a first line of treatment for syphilis. It became widely available across the United States. But none of the participants in the Tuskegee trial were offered treatment, my dear friends. This photograph was published on July 25th of 1972 by the Associated Press reporter, Miss Jean Heller. She took against the government. This news rocked the America at that time, my dear friends. 
Let's look at the timeline. In 1932, the Tuskegee trial was sanctioned to observe the course and outcome of syphilis. In mid-1940, that is in 1943, penicillin became available for treatment of syphilis and it was considered as a first line of treatment. From 1943 to 1972, none of the participants were offered penicillin, my dear friends. Not only that, none of them knew they were absorbed for syphilis. And this is the atrocity committed by the US. And finally, when the news was broken by Miss Jean Heller, there was a huge public cry and Belmont report came. And finally, in 1997, the US President Clinton apologized for the community for the wrongdoing. This is a very important understanding how the paternalistic attitude of the government and the doctors can take the people for granted and do research on them. Let's understand what is this Belmont report. After the Tuskegee trial, news broke out. There was a huge cry across US. And finally, the Belmont report Commission was formed. On February 1976, the Belmont Report was published. Please go through this Belmont Report. This Belmont Report is the foundation for the current clinical research informed consent, my dear friends. After this important discussion, let's move into another important case study. Salgo versus Leland Stanford. Junior University Board of Trustees in 1957. Let's understand this case. Law, my dear friends, Martin Salgo consulted Dr. Garbodo, a specialist in arterial disease. Mr. Martin had a complaints of leg cramp and in addition to that, right side abdominal pain, discomfort in the lower back and hip whenever he exercised. The blood pressure was 180 by 90. There was no femoral pulse on the right side and a weak femoral pulse on the left side. Possible diagnosis of occlusion of the abdominal aorta or generalized arteriosclerosis was considered. An aortography was planned. In order to do aortography, one need to locate the block and its extent of Proper surgery could be done. A study of gastrointestinal tract was conducted by barium meal and later an iotography was done. During the translumbar iotography, Mr. Salgo suffered a permanent paralysis of both legs and now Mr. Salgo became very upset. He went to the court on two issues. One is on negligence leading to paralysis and also failing to warn him about the risk of paralysis during the iotography. These were the two important counts he went to the court. And in the court, my dear friends, Salgo was awarded 2 lakh 13,355 dollars as a compensation from the Stanford University Hospital, my dear friends. In this case, the court articulated there is a need to move from physician advocate to the patient advocate. Here, the physician said that we do not discuss about the paralysis when we do iotography. But the court said, no, it is a patient right to self-determination and he has the right to know the whole information. Here, the patient advocate means helping and providing patients with necessary information to make an intelligent, informed decision to diagnostic or interventional procedure. This is the time where the important decision was made. That is, physician advocate versus patient advocate. The court did appear to suggest that full disclosure was required. 
but it did permit an element of physician discretion. The court said that a physician violates his duty to protect his patient and subject himself to liability if he withholds any factors which are necessary to form the basis of an intelligent consent by the patient to be proposed treatment. Likewise, the physician may not minimize the known dangers of a procedure or operation in order to induce his patient's consent. This was the case which introduced an important component called as current informed consent, my dear friend. That is informed consent and informed choice was used in this Salgo versus Leland Stanford and others 1957 case, my dear friends. However, Spencer's was Canterbury in 1972 brought in the complete disclosure required for informed consent. Let's understand this case, Spencer's versus Canterbury. In short, it is called as Canterbury Rule. Jerry Watson Canterbury was a FBI clerk who suffered from a ruptured disc at the T4, that is thoracic vertebra 4. So he consulted a well-known neurosurgeon, that is Dr. William T. Spence, who told the Jerry Watson Canterbury that he needs to undergo a laminectomy to correct the ruptured disc. Doctor did not inform the risk of laminectomy. The patient also did not ask what are the risks involved. But however, the Watson Canterbury gave the consent. Mr. Canterbury was operated by Dr. William T. Spence. Surgery was reasonably successful. However, there was a subsequent fall from the bed while hospitalized. Mr. Canterbury had to be reoperated. He was taken to the emergency OT and the surgery was done. Unfortunately, Mr. Canterbury condition did not improve. He ended up paralysis below the waist and he became incontinent which was lifelong. Hence, Mr. Canterbury went to the court with the count of negligence in the performance of laminectomy and for failure to inform about the risk involved. In the trial court, Dr. Spence reported that communication of the risk to the patient was not good medical practice because it might deter the undergoing procedure which is required for him. But however, the trial court held the doctor was not negligent because if you give 100% information, the patient may run away from the procedure. For example, if you tell the patient, you need to undergo laminectomy and during the laminectomy, there is a possibility you may develop complete paralysis or else you may even die. In such a scenario, nobody would like to undergo such, such surgery. Hence, the trial court said that the doctor, what, the doctor was not negligent. Mr. Canterbury went to Apex Court. Here, the Apex Court came up with the important judgment. This can be considered as a landmark judgment in the USA, which largely shifted the culture from professional practice standard to a reasonable person standard in disclosing the risk involved in any procedure. That means if the professionals decide that we will give you only 30% of information for that surgery across the country, that will not be considered as a valid consent. That's what the court said. That means professional practice standard will not be considered. It is a reasonable person standard. That means based upon the patient's appetite, about understanding about the information, about the procedure, what are the risks involved. And if he wants a complete disclosure, the doctor needs to give the complete information. In this case, the duty to provide information to the patient was completely failed. Hence, a reasonable person disclosure was brought in and that became the Canterbury standard my dear friends. What are the observations made by the court in this case? It is the physician's duty to warn whether the patient asks or not. 
it is the patient need to it is the duty of the physician to tell these are the possible side effects these are the risks involved and these are the side effects which can occur the patient has every right to know about the risks involved a risk material when a reasonable person in what the doctor knows or should know to be in the patient position would be likely to attach the significance to the risk or the cluster of risk in deciding whether or not to forego the proposed therapy that means if a doctor is performing a surgery for example appendicectomy what is the information he needs to give to the patient that means if the patient if the doctor becomes the patient and he needs to undergo appendicectomy what are the information he wants to know for the appendicectomy that information should be given to the patient so that the patient is well informed adequately informed and completely informed then only he can make the decision that is called as canterbury standard my dear friends also it is it is called as reasonable prudent test physicians privilege to withhold information does not include this paternalistic notion that the physician may remain silent simply because by providing information the patient will refuse the procedure every human being of a sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with the bo his own body will be was proposed in this spencer's versus canterbury my dear friends and this is called as reasonable patient test or prudent patient test my dear friends further in uk there was another important decision was proposed in 1985 this was a case law which is considered as sideway versus board of governors of bethlehem royal hospital mrs amy doris sideway who suffered from persistent pain in her neck and shoulder was advised by a surgeon to have an operation on her spinal column to relieve the pain here mrs sideway had a severe neck pain the surgeon warned the amy of the possibility of disturbing the nerve root and the possible consequences of of not doing surgery also but however he did not mention that there is a risk of injuring the spinal cord because the risk was were hardly 1% amy sideway consented for the operation and the operation occurred unfortunately the during the operation amy sideway suffered injury to the spinal cord which resulted in severe disability that means she had paralysis she went to the court against the doctors and the bethlehem royal hospital for the injury she suffered in this judgment the trial judge applied the bolam test the judge said whether the surgeon had acted in accordance with the accepted medical practice and found that majority of the doctor did not inform this 1% risk of spinal cord hence the trial court said that doctor is not negligent hence amy sideway appealed to the higher court even in the higher court reported that doctrine of informed consent is based upon the professional standard hence the medical negligence was rejected this was in uk my dear friends at the time the us talked about complete disclosure uk discussed only a reasonable doctor standard of providing the information this was there till 2015 in uk there was another landmark judgment that is montgomery versus langshire health board decision which occurred in 2015 here mrs montgomery a woman of small stature who suffered from insulin dependent diabetes she was elderly and also she was pregnant 
She was under antenatal care. She took a regular antenatal checkup. During the vaginal delivery, the umbilical cord was occluded. This deprived the baby from the oxygen since the umbilical cord was compressed. After the birth of the child, the child had dyskinetic cerebral palsy. The mother, Montgomery, was very upset and she went to the court against the doctor and the hospital. She reported, since it was a precious pregnancy, she was short-statured, she was diabetic and during the ultrasound, they found that baby was large. But the doctor did not talk about shoulder dystocia, resulting in umbilical cord compression or cord compression and the possible cerebral palsy was not discussed with her. This was her argument in the court of law. Since Mr. Mrs. Montgomery was not told about the risk of shoulder dystocia, which was around 10, 9 to 10 percent, and the, none of the doctors discussed with that, the disclosure of the risk would lead to women of electing cesarean section was the apprehension of the doctor. He said that if I said there is a 10 percent of shoulder dystocia which results with cerebral palsy, most of the women will choose cesarean. Hence, I did not inform the patient. Here the Supreme Court rejected the doctor's claim and it affirmed the required of informed choice and informed concern for a medical treatment and that rests the fundamentally fundamentally the duty of the physician to disclose all information was brought in that hence the doctor is therefore under a duty to take reasonable care to ensure the patient is aware of all maternal risk or material risk involved in a recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative or variant treatments are available this was a landmark judgment in UK, my dear friends. It talked about informed choice, it talked about informed consent and it placed the complete responsibility on the doctor to provide all possible risks to the patient. The judgment also said, Bolam test was quashed regarding the information for disclosure with regard to informed consent and it clearly said that reasonable physician standard will no longer will hold good in UK and in UK now the prudent patient test prevails that means it is the fundamental duty of the doctor to disclose the material risks involved in a recommended treatment based upon the need of the reasonable patient test to conclude there was earlier paternalistic attitude of the doctor who decided whether I should inform about the diagnosis, about the treatment, about the risk was involved. I will decide what is best for the patient. That was his paternalistic attitude. That was the conventional method. Over a period of time, it moved into consent. That the debate was how much information should be given during the consent. Whether the Bolan test should be placed or the Canterbury test should be provided whether it is a reasonable physician standard or else reasonable patient standard that means informed concerned needs at this point of time in UK and US a reasonable patient test that means 100% compliance with regard to providing information the obligation is placed on the physician my dear friends Hence, you need to understand that this paradigm shift which has occurred from the paternalistic attitude of the doctor to the reasonable physician standard. That means, if all the doctors are providing similar information, that much information I will be giving during the informed consent. That also has been rejected. Now, it is the prudent patient test. That is a reasonable patient test. All reasonable risk, materialistic risk, 
or the risk involved in the procedure need to be disclosed to the patient and that obligation has been placed on the physician. And this is the decision which is there in UK and US and that prudent patient test prevails in UK and US. With regard to India, I'll be discussing what is the legal standard which is applied for informed consent in my next video. Hence, my dear friends, please subscribe and also press the bell icon to get the latest update on informed consent and the legal issues with regard to informed consent in India. Thank you very much. Stay safe.